Good morning. <laughs> it's uh, it's David again, and um, gosh, it's uh, it's four in the morning. <laughs> About an hour ago, one of my uh, friends in Utah uh, called me <laughs> in the middle of the night. Uh, the the time zone thing can be a bit of a challenge when you're on the other side of the world and. He thought I was uh, uh, later than him, but actually I'm earlier. <laughs> so he thought he was calling me, you know, during the day, and it was uh, three in the morning. And um, anyway, I ended up uh, looking at my email before I went back to sleep, which is always a big mistake. <laughs> Oh man. So if I look like if I look like I uh just rolled out of bed in the middle of the night, I did. <laughs> in any case, um I've been crying a bit because I think many of you'll be able to relate to this, but there's things that I've seen in our heavenly Father's word for a long long time and uh, couldn't find any place where it was real and uh, but I could still see it you know in my heart in my spirit in my mind's eye and yearn for it and even try to bring it about you know and fail but uh, there's been Two, two passages of Scripture, many, many passages of Scripture from the Bible that have been precious to me for a long, long time. But there's two in particular that have just burned in my heart for decades. And uh, I live in the middle of a people for whom this is normal now. And I, I just think, I just think it, it's so easy to take it for granted. Uh the video I just made the other day about this Mississippi bishop who resigned and how the real news is not that one bishop uh, resigned and uh, uh, the real news and, and made a public show of it, but the, the real news is the 24,000 bishoprics, you know, bishops and their two counselors each, uh, approximately the 75,000 men that lay down their lives for the flock every day and just carry that burden faithfully because as Paul told the Ephesian bishops when he met them in Miletus at the end of Acts 20, he said, Remember the words of the Lord Jesus that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And uh, I got a letter. I just I just read it. I've been weeping because it's it's so beautiful. It's just so beautiful. And uh, I just really I have to share it with you. And so this is a bishop's perspective of the Mississippi bishop who resigned. All right. I'm going to have to duck off to the side and blow my nose. This is probably a, a 10 blow nose video. Excuse me. <coughs> but before I read his letter, I really wanted to share these two portions of scripture from my heart. And um, one, because when I read this letter, you'll see this, this is what, this is what Jesus Christ was talking about at the Last Supper. That's one of the portions of Scripture that I'm going to share with you. And the other one is, this is what, this letter is what Jesus was talking about in John 15, around uh, verse uh, 11 to 18. And it's also what Paul was talking about when he met with the, the bishops, the overseers from Ephesus met him in Miletus at the end of Acts 20, and he gives he knows he, they'll never see him again. And so these are his last words to them, what, what he considered most important that they would grab a hold of and not forget. 
And I just want to share those two portions of scripture. So as I read this letter, you'll see this is this is what it looks like on the ground, those two verses, those two portions of scripture. The first one from John chapter 15. I just, I just love this portion of scripture. I just love I just love Jesus Christ. Just his heart just is so pure and selfless and his call to us is the same way pure and selfless just stunning he says to them he's at they're sharing the Passover meal and he's pouring out the deepest things in his heart knowing that he's going to bear their griefs and sorrows very shortly and begin to shed his blood culminating you know starting in the garden and culminating on the cross for all of their sins, which were many. Actually, in, in Luke, amazingly, after three and a half years with him every day, him teaching them to be humble and not to try to be the big cheese and to, to just, he who is greatest among you must be as the servant of all. It says in Luke at the Last Supper, after, after he washes their feet <laughs> and says, if I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also must wash one another's feet. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. They get in another jealous argument over which of them is the greatest. It's just amazing. And his response is to go out after dinner. and I thank thee, Father, that the glory you've given me, I've given them, that they might be one. I mean, he just believed in them so much. They couldn't make him stop believing in them, but boy, they sure tried. They gave it their best shot. Um, but in any case, in John 15, this is at the Passover meal, Jesus Christ says to them, he says, look, these things I'm commanding you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be made full. Love one another just as I have loved you. There's no greater love than this than a man would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And this is my commandment, that you love one another, that you lay down your life for your friends. And, um, of course, that, that's from the Gospel of John. John wrote down the record of that conversation. And that's such a critical thing when John wrote his first epistle. If you read in John chapter 3, verse 14 and 16, he amplifies that even further. He says, we know, we know that we have passed from death into life. Why? Because we prayed the sinner's prayer. No, he doesn't say that. He says, we know we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. And this is how we know what love is. He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And then he goes on saying, you know, if we see our brother in need and we have the means to meet his need and we don't do it, how can the love of God be in us? So, little children, let us not love in word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are, that we belong to him and we set our hearts at rest in his presence because we keep his commandments and we do those things that are pleasing in his sight and we know whatever we ask we receive from him because we keep his commandments and we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So in 1 John 3, John makes really clear that our confidence, our joy, our fullness of salvation, our knowing, uh, our certainty, our assurance of salvation, and our, our certainty that our prayers are heard, our, our faith to pray and know that our Heavenly Father hears us. The, the foundation of that is that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost that's been given unto us, and we don't just let it sit there dormant. We love with it. <laughs> you know, we don't just have love. We love with it. And that's how that that's the fruit that's the fruit that demonstrates that we really have 
saving faith. And we really have passed from death unto life. And we really are on the narrow way that leads to life, headed towards fulfilling our divine potential. So that, that's what he says. He says, I'm commanding you this, John 15, that, that your joy, that my joy would remain with you and your joy would be made full. You want joy? Love one another just as I have loved you. There's no greater love than this than a man would lay down his life for his friends. And then the second portion of Scripture is very related to this. Uh, the chief on the ground of, of the true church, the chief exemplars of this love, of, of selfless love, are the bishops, the bishopric, the bishop and his two counselors. Of course, we're all called to be exemplars of this love, but they're really called to be the exemplars of this love. And they do it, uh, like Peter said to the elders there, he said, not for filthy lucre's sake, but of a ready mind. They, they just, uh, they rise to the challenge of laying down their life for their friends and feeding the flock of God, shepherding the flock of God and caring for the weak. And this is what Paul, he, he called, he's on his way to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 20. He knows he's not going to have another chance ever to see the bishops of all of the wards, the huge, many thousands of people responded in Ephesus. Paul lived there for three years and discipled and raised up who knows how many bishops there. Many, many bishops. And he sends ahead a message to Ephesus and says, look, I can't get to Ephesus, but meet me in Miletus on my way to Jerusalem because I, I've got some things I have to say to you and you're never going to see me again. So this, this is my last chance to tell you what's what. And uh, I'm paraphrasing, of course, here. But anyway, they gather in Miletus and Paul addresses them. And it's, it's such a beautiful thing. But he, he prophesies the beginning of the apostasy. And of course, this is just of his his segment of the church. He was set apart by the apostolic and prophetic council in Jerusalem. They, they were focusing on the Jews. And he was set apart to the Gentiles to gather Israel and to proclaim the gospel among the Gentiles throughout the Pax Romana. And he meets the Ephesian bishops there. And uh, his last words to, th to them are this. He says, You know how I lived among you for three years. I coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine provided for my own needs and for the needs of those that were with me. And then he says this. He says, I have shown you in every single thing that I did. So as he lived among them for three years, he had a very clear focus. In everything that he did, he wanted to give them a living example of something. So he says, You know how I lived among you for three years. I coveted no man's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine provided for myself and for those that were with me. I have shown you in everything that I did that by this kind of hard work, you, you, you Ephesian bishops, you overseers, I've shown you in everything that I did by this kind of hard work, you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And then it says, it says, and they fell on his neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for what he had said, that they would never see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. So, you know, it's, isn't it beautiful? It's so beautiful. So anyway... That's what I was looking for, you know. That's what I want to be myself, you know. Not that I aspire to be a bishop, but, you know, it does say, it, it does, you know, if any man aspires to be a bishop, he, he desires a good thing, you know. If, if you want to de desire something good, desire to be in a position where, where you have the responsibility 
to pour your life out for others. And you do it. And what you'll find there is joy. And you won't find that joy anywhere else. Anywhere else on earth. There is no greater love than this than a man would lay down his life for his friends. He said, Jesus says, these things I command you, that my joy might remain with you and your joy might be made full. Love one another just as I have loved you. There is no greater joy than this than a man would lay down his life for his friends. No greater love than this. No greater joy. So, you know, those are words in a book. Uh, my experience is that for the most part, I'm not saying entirely, but my word, throughout now Notre Dame Saint Christianity, it's a professional ministry. It's a career path. Uh, th that kind of love was extraordinarily rare in my Christian experience. I couldn't find it anywhere, anywhere. I tried to be that way myself, and I succeeded to some extent at times, but whew, that's not the culture of evangelical, Pentecostal, and charismatic Christianity and you know, non-Latter-day Saint Christianity. The pastors, bishops, overseers are all, not all, but uh, the, the vast majority of them are professionals. And I'm not saying they just do it for the money. They, their heart's in it, but... It's their living, and that really has a big effect on the purity of their service, even if they're entirely well-intentioned. So in any case, <laughs> uh, this was a much longer introduction and interjection than I expected, but the purpose of this video is to read uh, one of the more amazing letters I've ever read. I read this letter, and I just started crying because it's so beautiful. But this letter, I'm not going to give this bishop's full name. His name's David. But uh, those of you that watch my channel know if you send me something and you don't specifically command me to keep it private <laughs> and it's on my heart, I think it'll encourage the saints and, and put to shame the scoffers. You know, <laughs> I'm going to put it out there. Okay. But I'm going to respect this man's privacy uh, to the extent the wonderful bishop, his name is Bishop David, okay? He's not me, <laughs> but he's Bishop David. And he just sent me this letter that I read in the middle of the night. I, I was going to go right back to sleep, but I glanced at this and I started reading. And I just started weeping because this letter is what those verses that I just shared look like what it looks like on the ground, okay? And the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is filled with countless thousands and thousands. I mean, the bishop and his two counselors, every, every ward has its bishopric. Those three men all lay down their lives for their friends to feed the flock of God, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, as Peter commands. He says, I, Peter, who am also a bishop, command you this, just as Paul commanded them at the end of Acts 20. But uh, what is it, 75,000 strong? The, the real news <laughs> is, is not this one bishop that just made a public show of resigning in Mississippi. The real news, the, the thing that deserves to be shouted from the housetops is the 75,000 men that live lives in some measure like what Bishop David describes here. So with that, uh, I'm just going to read his letter. And, you know, we can, we can just uh, weep together a bit and thank Heavenly Father that there's such men on the earth whose example we can uh, strive to follow. Okay? faithful men and their wives and their families that support them like this what 75,000 strong in 170 some countries around the world 
That's the news, man. That is the news that deserves to be shouted from the housetops. So here we go. All right. David's letter is entitled, A Bishop's Perspective of the Mississippi Bishop Who Resigned. And it's from David, Bishop David. Hi, Brother Alexander. I love your channel. I appreciate you sharing your wonderful testimony with the world like you do. I'm currently serving as a bishop and have been for about four and a half years. I served a mission in Mississippi, and with the recent resignation of that Mississippi bishop, my heart ached for the sweet people in Mississippi, and my heart ached for that bishop. Being a bishop can be hard, and I'm so sorry it hasn't been a good experience for him. I want to share with you how this has been for me as a bishop. A few months prior to getting called to be a bishop, the Spirit really started working on me. I was having dreams and little frequent spiritual manifestations that gave me a powerful impression that the call was coming. A bishop calling was a call that I did not want. Don't get me wrong. I love the Lord, and even before the call, I tried my best to serve Him. I just really didn't know if I could do it. I worked a lot of long hours, and I was worried that the calling would take its toll on my family. I was worried that my wife and kids would never get to see their dad. I love being a dad, and my family time is precious to me. As the time grew closer to the call coming, it weighed heavier and heavier on my heart. One day while I was driving with my 13-year-old son, we were deep in the discussion and I told him about the feelings I was having. I told him that I felt like the call was coming. I told him I was worried for a couple of reasons. One, that I couldn't do it. Second, that it would take me away from the family more. My son sat there and I could see the gears turning in that 13-year-old head. Hold on a second. <coughs> He looked at me with confidence and said, Dad, Heavenly Father will help you. You know that, right? <sighs> when he said that, it pierced my heart with its own spiritual witness. I sat there in my truck trying my best to fight back tears as I knew he was right. I looked over at him, smiled through the tears and said, Oh yeah, I taught you that, didn't I? <laughs> Two weeks later, I was called to be the bishop of a very large ward. The following Sunday, I was set apart for the calling. After the stake president lifted his hands off my head, we got up, opened the door to the Relief Society room, only to be met by two people needing to see the bishop. The first was the elders quorum president, informed me that, that a 17-year-old girl in our ward had just passed and the second man was a homeless man needing help. I didn't even make it to the bishop's office to sit down and reflect. It was on. Within 20 minutes of my calling, I found myself on a porch crying with two grieving parents over the loss of their daughter. I didn't know how to be a bishop, but I did know love, and I gave every ounce of what I had. I left their house and in my car picked up the phone to make hotel arrangements for the homeless man, hung up the phone only to receive another call. I thought to myself, am I going to be able to do this? The words of my son came back to me. Heavenly Father will help you, and it still burned in my heart. I prayed for his help, and guess what? He helped. He has helped. He continues to help. It didn't take long for me to realize I had grossly underestimated how much Heavenly Father would help in this calling. <coughs> Heavenly Father has worked miracles. One of the biggest miracles has been in my own little family. They've been so supportive. Inside of one week of the calling, my professional life had a major adjustment and time was freed up for me. My time with my family increased. My closeness to my family increased. Now here I am in the sunset of this calling, and I can honestly say I have loved serving as a bishop. 
When I was called, something happened. A feeling of love for the members of my ward rested on my heart. The only way I can explain it, it is like the same kind of love I feel for my own children. Don't get me wrong. I liked my ward before. It's just different now. I found a level of love that I did not know I was capable of having. With all that love comes joy. I felt so bad for that bishop as I watched him resign. I felt like he missed out so much on so much that the calling has to offer. In this calling, I figured out the greatest secret to living a happy life. That secret is in loving and serving God and others. I'm a happy guy by nature, but I've never been so happy as I am now as I have served in this calling. One Sunday, the bishop load was heavy. I had been at the church from 5.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. It was a long day. As I wrapped up the day, I was tired. I was hungry and I was excited to go home and be with my family. As I was leaving the bishop's office, my cell phone rang. It was my sweet neighbor calling. Her elderly husband had a nosebleed, and due to some of his medications, the bleeding wouldn't stop. I drove straight to their house. For the next couple of hours, I fought that bloody nose with them as I took turns pinching his nose and plugging it off with tissue paper. That night, I walked into my house at around 10.30 p.m. My wife and kids were all in bed. I changed out of my bloody clothes, washed up, and warmed up my cold Sunday dinner and ate it alone. After my late dinner, I knelt down for my own personal prayers. As I prayed, I told Heavenly Father that I loved him, and I asked him to accept my day, that I hoped he knew how much I love him. I ended my prayer, and something happened. A feeling that came over me, that if I could describe it, would be how I imagined the people felt in Lehi's dream after they partook of the fruit. I felt my Heavenly Father's love. It was sweet, above all that I ever before tasted. My soul was filled with exceedingly great joy. David, I can tell you with every feeling of my heart that I have loved being a bishop. I suppose there are 24,000 plus bishops. And I just have to add, and you know, there are 48,000 counselors too. I suppose there are 24,000 bishops and there are 48,000 counselors who feel the same way. Thank you for all that you do. I'm so glad you are with us, serving and sharing your voice. Best regards, Bishop Dave. Oh, my. Isn't that beautiful? That is just so beautiful. Bishop Dave, that is so beautiful. And all you other bishops out there, please, please pray for your bishops. Pray for their counselors. <laughs> oh, that is so beautiful. And you know what? We're all called to love like that. If we're not called to be bishops, we're still called to love like that. Do you know? That's how we know we've passed from death unto life, because we're doing our faulty best each day to love like that. And uh, that's the foundation of our confidence before our Heavenly Father, is that we love like that, or at least we're trying our faulty best to love like that. But in any case, Bishop Dave, bless your heart. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Oh, my... That is, that's a picture of those verses I shared. That's a picture of what it looks like because of the incredible atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ and because we saw the glory of the atonement and responded to the plan of salvation and the love of God's been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost that's been given unto us. We can actually love like that. And uh, Bishop Dave, Bishop David's been carrying the glorious, joyful burden of loving like that now for four and a half years. And uh, it's just a beautiful thing, Bishop Dave, that, that you've 
love like that and all the bishops out there that love like that. It's just so glorious. And uh, Anyway, it's such a beautiful thing. To be on the highway of holiness. <laughs> to be on the highway of holiness on the covenant path with with men such as Bishop David just makes my heart sing. It just makes my heart sing. It's what I yearn for and look for my entire life is to be able to walk with brothers like Bishop David. And a highway shall be and a way called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring man, though a fool shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return And come to Zion with song And everlasting joy upon their head They shall obtain joy and gladness And sorrow and sign will flee away Zion, Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Father, Father, when will the wedding be? When will I sit by your side as a beautiful bride and bathe in your presence? We need to uh, pray for our bishops, don't we? <laughs> we also need to uh, walk up to them after we pray for them and say, Bishop, what can I do to help? <laughs> but, of course, everybody does that. Or, you know, uh, what a wonderful thing to be in the true church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for Bishop David, Bishop Dave, and all of those tens of thousands of bishops and counselors, what, maybe 75,000 strong, the bishoprics, the bishops and their two counselors that serve in all of the, the what is I don't know, 25 to 35,000 wards all over the earth. It's just astounding. 
Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would just, just as, that their experience would be as glorious as Bishop David's, that, uh, that you would strengthen them, that you would protect them, that you would give them your glory, that they can go about just as you did, Jesus, doing good and healing all who are oppressed of the devil, for you are with them. And please, just strengthen them all, body, soul, spirit, family, finances, relationships, health in every way. Strengthen these glorious men and give them your glory that they can serve you with power and effectiveness. And please, Heavenly Father, open open the eyes of the hungry and thirsty souls out there in non-Latter-day Saint Christianity that are truly looking for the city that has foundations whose builder and maker is you and that you would open their eyes to the glory of the restoration and of the true church, the glory of Joseph Smith and all the prophets that have come since him and the glory of the, the selfless service of the, the bishoprics of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Just draw, draw the needy sheep, draw the thirsty souls to the place where they can find rest. And we just ask these things in the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I didn't think I could go back to sleep till I made this video, so it's, it's, uh, it's 5 to 5 a.m. now, so maybe I can go back to sleep for a couple of hours. Love you all dearly. And uh, pray for your bishops. <laughs> Amen.